is Man Made Need, and today we're doing a little different video. We're going to be talking about the six beginner mistakes that you might be making. These are all been mistakes that I have made previously, and I'm not even going to begin, begin to say that I am perfect by any means. But um, in my six or seven months of experience, um, I've learned about a lot of the, the things you don't want to do. So hopefully I can uh, share those things with you. So we're going to go through them, and let's get started with it. The first things first, the mistake that a lot of people make is that they will pick, when they're beginning a, ye a need, they'll pick a yeast that is not suitable for what their goal is. So, um, your yeast choice is so important to your actual mead success. So right now I have, uh, I did a bunch of notes and I'll end up putting these up um, and putting a link to them so you can kind of follow along as what I'm saying. But, and if I'm looking over here, it's because I'm reading, reading the notes, but we're going to go through these kind of quickly too, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ultimately have some different things, and I'll talk about that as I'm going along. So, uh, in short, basically, yeast are creatures just like us. They rely on certain nutrients and temperature ranges and other various things to be successful. So, they also, each yeast has a different, um, an al different alcohol tolerance and then um, a different, like, set in uh, best suited uh, nutrient. So with the alcohol tolerance, basically that means that if, you're, if your yeast can only handle a 14% alcohol per volume, um, then you're only going to be able to get that from your mead. So uh, a lot, some of them are you know, 14%, 18%, whatever your yeast says on the packet. And you have to consider that whenever you're actually making the mead and putting in your ingredients because uh, they will cap out at that certain point, okay? Uh, so, each yeast has an ideal nutrient or set of nutrients uh, that it uses best when going through fermentation. Uh, they, with the temperature range, you also have to keep them within that. So some of them have a wide range, and we're going to talk about a few different yeasts. Um, but then some of them have a really small range of where you need to keep them as they ferment. Uh, through outside of those ranges, they'll still ferment, but it might be slower. It might not work as well. Um, there are also different categories of, you know, some yeasts do better with mellow mills and um, that category of mead and then some just do well with traditional meads uh, and then it just really depends on what the goal and goal is for you. you. So summarizing that, uh, I'm going to use four different meads and they're all Lavalin meads, so the ones I use, I really like them, I think they're great. So it's, there's the uh, Lavalin D47, Lavalin EC1118, the Lavalin KV1116 and the Lavalin 71B1122. Now in a second I'll tell you about all those different um, ranges and how well they do with uh, temperature range and the alcohol tolerance. But to break those down real fast, in this category right here, the uh, Lavalin D47 and EC1118 are great for traditional meads. Um, and then the Lavalin K1B1116 and 71B1122 are great for mellow mills. Now those can be broken down into two even further categories and I'll talk about that in another video which I'll uh, link at the end of the segment for you to go and watch. Um, so to quickly summarize though, the D47 has a alcohol tolerance of 14% and the temperature range of 59 to 68, you have to keep it within that range. Next is your EC1118, and its alcohol tolerance is higher at 18%. It has a wide range of 45 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, I should say, um, for its temperature range. The K1B1116 uh, yeast has 18% alcohol tolerance and a uh, temperature of 59 to 86. And then the 71B1122 has a 14% alcohol tolerance and the temperature range of 59. To 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So all those are great, great um, yeast. There are millions of yeast out there, and so you can choose whatever one you want. I just like those because I've, I know about them well, and they kind of suit between those four categories suit my needs. So uh, when you are picking a yeast for your meat, you have to be so careful, and you need to actually make uh, the real choice. You can't just pick a random yeast and hope for the best because it might not pair as well as you hope. So. First things first, your yeast choice. Don't make the mistake of making a poor yeast choice. Next, we have um, 
the problem that people don't know the difference between primary and secondary fermentation. So the primary fermentation uh, basically happens in the first uh, 60 days, one to 60 days of Mimi's life. So um, in, in primary, you know, it can vary too, depending on what, what's happening and how the, uh, the yeast and everything's fermenting in the mead. But basically, the primary stage, uh, it, like I said, it lies in the window, general window of time your mead is in. The primary stage, um, let's see, sorry, I'm reading my notes. Some uh, meads will ferment rather quickly and might finish really fast in two weeks, in three weeks, four weeks, you know. Um, and some might finish in a long time, eight weeks, 12 weeks, spend, uh, excuse me, have some trouble going along, and so they take a little while longer, and that's okay. That's just how some yeast works. Some take a long time, some take a little bit, okay? Um, so you have to basically just watch for your primary fermentation, which is that first little bit when you first introduce the yeast into the must, and then starts bubbling and fermenting and all that stuff, that's your primary. Now, um, once that bubbling is slowed down to kind of the rule of thumb people will say is uh, between 30 seconds per bubble to like three minutes per bubble. It's kind of a good area. Um, or completely stop. Then your fermentation has stopped your primary fermentation. Now, whenever you open it up, rack it and do everything, you might restart the actual uh, fermentation again. And that's okay. That's where we come into secondary fermentation. Now, secondary fermentation, uh, basically, most people use secondary for adding their extra ingredients. So in the primary, they'll just do their yeast, their water, and their honey, and um, their yeast nutrient, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So in secondary, they'll start to add in, if you want apples, if you want bananas, if you want, you know, oranges, whatever you're doing, you know, kind of thing. There are a bunch of different options, but whenever you put it into the secondary, what you're doing is you're allowing for the yeast uh, to have run their course, primarily run their course through the bulk of the honey, and now there is some alcohol content in the honey which protects the fruit and the um, everything from rotting and like getting bacteria. Uh, the alcohol cannot will kill the bacteria pretty quickly. So you don't have to worry about this stuff. It's kind of nice to do that. Um, and just the big thing to note between primary and your secondary fermentation is primary, first little bit of fermentation. Secondary is when your uh, fermenting might start up again. Now. You don't have to go into secondary fermentation. That's something. Uh, you can do primary fermentation. The fermentation might stop completely. If you're doing a traditional mead and you don't have to back sweet, you don't have to do anything like that, basically, you're just going to rack it and it'll go into its first racks. And that's just it. However, if you purposefully restart the, um, the fermentation again with some fruit or maybe some more honey or maybe something else, you are starting it into by putting it into secondary fermentation. Now, there's not a third fermentation, anything like that. There is uh, just racks after that, for the most part. So, um, knowing the difference, primary, you can put your fruits in. You can put your ingredients in. That's great. A lot of people go back and forth between which they want to do. Um, secondary is where most people do end up putting their fruits and all that stuff. Okay? Thirdly, now, this one, I... Um, it took me a while to, get to actually do, and it is going to be, my board's getting a little crazy right now. Um, it is going to, to be about providing your yeast nutrients. Uh, now, this is about providing your yeast nutrients and everything they need to survive. This is the third thing. So number three, um, your yeast, like I said, our creatures, and they need the same things that we need. And that means they need their nutrients, they need oxygen, and they need just these varying things. And without them, they are not successful. So, uh, the nutrients can come from things like the honey, um, but in, you know, in part, they'll only, the yeast will use that honey grape, that, that's what they turn into the alcohol, but they need more than just the nutrients that the honey provide. Honey have nutrients, but it's not as nutritious as they need. Um, so they need yeast nutrient, which is a specific thing, and then they could use some energizer too. So uh, you can do this in a couple different fashions. You can give them a staggered nutrient schedule, which uh, 
basically runs the course of like the first week to first two weeks. And what you do is you break down the yeast nutrient you would have put in just all at once and you put it in over the course of a couple days. So some people might do it on the second day, fourth day, sixth day, eighth day. And they'll just put in a quarter of what the whole mass was. And so they're adding it over time. And that works too. That's something I've done before. And I think it's pretty good. Um, I... You know, I would not encourage anyone to wait a long time before you put your nutrient into the yeast because what you are creating um, is you're making it harder for the yeast to actually uh, work. They need as much power as they can initially to actually be successful. So if they're properly fed, they'll have a more successful um, journey through the fermentation process. So the yeast also need oxygen. So when you are giving your yeast oxygen, you are putting it generally into the must. And when you put it into the must, what you're allowing them is to uh, take and use the oxygen and put it into the CO2 that comes out in the air bubbles and the airlock and all that stuff. So uh, you need to aerate your must. And you can do that by stirring it, by shaking it, by using machines. Some people buy an aerator where they actually buy just pure uh, oxygen, O2, and then they pump it straight in. That's the best and ideal way, but it can be expensive. Or you can use, um, I have a little bitty uh, aerating machine that I'll show as well. And that machine, you just plug in, has a, a little, uh, takes the oxygen, pumps it through into an oxygen stone, you put it into your meat, and that starts getting it that way too. However, that one takes a little while longer, so you have to leave it. But the most important thing is your yeast need oxygen, and they need a lot of it. They don't need just like five minutes of it. So aerate it, shake it, do something to where your must is full of oxygen so they can last longer. Um, the yeast use that first, and so it goes by real fast. And so you just have to watch out for that and keep that in mind. Okay? Um, let's see. So giving your yeast all the nutrients, nutrients being your um, honey, that's great, and then yeast nutrient like, um, I love Firm NK, and then also Go Firm Protect. Those are two amazing sources for um, giving your yeast nutrients to survive. And uh, and I'll go further into with, with another video, but you need to add your, I like to add my nutrients into um, the yeast water as it's first hydrating. But I won't go into that. This is a short version of all of this. So adding and providing your yeast with appropriate nutrients is so super important. Okay, so review real fast. Uh, number one, you need to pick a wise yeast for your project, whatever you want your mead to end up. You need to know the difference between primary and secondary fermentation and how you're going to use the information. Provide your yeast, on number three, with the proper nutrients and oxygen. Number four, what this one I have done a video on before, but you need to sanitize your equipment properly. This is something that I, uh, I did not think about a lot when I first started with it. And it actually, I think it did get me in some trouble just because uh, bacteria are ruthless and they will absolutely ruin a mead so so quickly so i encourage you to um sanitize things and the way you do it is you buy a product that will allow you to sanitize things easier let me move over here so you can sanitize uh things with uh there's a lot of different products and i found mine on amazon uh it is a one-step sanitizer basically it's just a uh, you take your water and you take the actual stuff and you put it in like a teaspoon and it's a teaspoon per gallon and you can run it through your through your uh, glassware and all your uh, all your equipment and that will sanitize it and allow it to be good but ultimately when you are making a mead uh, getting rid of every bacteria source will make it so much more successful this is super super important in the primary stage too in the first before the alcohol is developed the alcohol does help fight against the bacteria, but that won't happen until secondary or the first rack stage. So if you wait that long to start and actually uh, sanitize things, it's going to be too late and you're going to mess up your meat in some way. So uh, sanitize your equipment, um, bacteria cause off flavors, and it's just something that you can't turn around. Once the ingredient's in there, it's super hard to get the off 
flavors to go away. And that's just how it works. So, um, number five, this one sounds silly, but uh, it's something that I ran into and I still experience sometimes, is not being patient. You need to be patient with your actual mead. Meads are not, some meads might take only two months, three months to finish, and then they might need to age to six, and that's great. Some other meads might need two years before they are, are drinkable at best, at their best, excuse me. So uh, the thing with a mead is, the longer it ages, the better it tastes. And I think that a lot of people know that already, but we get impatient and we wanna go, okay, well, I wanna drink it right now. So, um, so this entrails quite a few different things. Lots of people aren't patient waiting for their product to age. Uh, people don't really allow for the primary, the secondary, or racking stages to fully run their course. So you, you can easily pull a mead out of primary stage too early and that can hurt it. That won't run the gravity. You know, you won't have the full gravity go through and so you won't have your alcohol content at its max. Um, if the yeast does not slow down and you go ahead and move the mead, you're ultimately hurting it. For a mead to be truly successful, each element has to run its course. This means that the primary stage needs to go to completion, then the secondary or racking stages also need to be completed. Um, I've, like I said, I've been victim of this before and they haven't turned out as great as they could just because I've racked too early um, I've, or I've taken off a primary too early and so the 1.12 gravity that I had only got to like 1.06 because I didn't let it drop. And so while that's a sweeter mead, it's great, you're not, uh, you don't have as strong of a mead. And I like a strong mead, and that's just my own, um, that's just my own thing. Um, let's see. You can even put your yeast in the must too early. So the yeast themselves need to be properly hydrated. And so whenever you are actually including them into that must, um, if you put them in, if you just hydrate them for five minutes and throw them in, they're not fully ready. So uh, to synopsize this, make sure you hydrate your yeast for long enough, allow the primary, secondary, and uh, the racking stages to run their course. And when you are racking, don't rack the mead until it is free or until the sediment has settled at the bottom. If you're racking and the sediment hasn't settled at the bottom, you're just going to keep moving over sediment and sediment and sediment. Uh, you shouldn't bottle until fermentation is completely stopped or, or you've put uh, a thing called potassium sorbate. What that will do is that will completely kill all the fermentation process. It is a chemical though. So chemicals can come with their problems and they can hurt the meat ultimately. But a lot of people in commercial companies do that to get their um, the alcohol to stop fermenting and then get it into the next stages for them. And if you bottle too early before the fermentation has completely stopped, even the small, small stuff, um, there's pressurizing that could happen in the bottle and that creates a hazard. So just be, be patient with it, uh, with the mead making process is not something that happens overnight, um, but your end result is what you want. You don't want to have a, have a mead that did not turn out as good as you like. Okay, now the final thing is, you need to um, acclimate your yeast before it enters the must. Now a lot of people don't think about this uh, in the packet, it just says, you know, Okay, put it in uh, X amount of water for 20 to 30 minutes, and then you can put it in the must. Now there are a couple problems with that. When you're acclimating your yeast, um, I imagine it like, like if you had a, a little kid that never knew how to swim, and you just threw him into a pool. That's not good. That's not gonna, ha not, not gonna go well for the kid. In the same way, the yeast um, work in that kind of fashion. So you have to actually acclimate them. And the way to acclimate them is, of course, go through the process of heating up your water to the certain degree. So if it needs to be 109 degrees, heat it up to 109 degrees, then put your yeast in, and then maintain the yeast water at that temperature. Now there's a bunch of different ways to do it. You can leave it on the heat and kind of watch it, but watch your yeast water and make sure that it stays at that temperature, because that is the optimal temperature for the yeast to start to acclimate and to uh, hydrate. Okay. So there's another thing, and this is, I'll go deeper into this with another video, but you also need to um, acclimate them after they've gone through the 30 minute process, whatever time, to, uh, to the, now the temperature that your must is. If you just throw them in, you're going from like 110 degrees of yeast 
water to maybe 60 degrees or 7 degrees, 70 degrees of uh, must. And that's also can be harmful to the yeast. Ultimately, you want to give them the easiest experience possible. Um, and you can do that by a couple things. First thing is you can actually take some of your must water once the yeast has run its course through the hydrating start to put a little bit of that must water into the yeast water and that will get them used to the gravity they're about to experience because um, the gravity is higher than the yeast water so it's going to be much higher so it'll allow them to get used to that it also brings the temperature down for the um, the yeast water to ultimately equal the same thing as the must water so put some of the must over over time and then just be patient with that. You know, it shouldn't be something that if you're impatient and you just throw your stuff in, you might damage the yeast and you want the yeast to have as much life as possible um, and to make it easy, easiest for them. Now, like I said, I'll go into another video, but the last thing is you want to, and I like to do this, I like to give them some nutrients while they're actually in the yeast uh, hydrating mode. And I'll talk about that more in another video. But to recap really fast, we have a couple things. Number one, you have to pick a good yeast for your mead. The mead, uh, one that's appropriate for what your goal is. Number two, you need to know the difference between primary and secondary fermentation, because um, that's a big difference, and the different stages can yield different results for things. Number three, provide your yeast with proper nutrients in air and oxygen, uh, whenever you are in the must portion, and that will allow them to be most successful. Sanitize your equipment properly, um, have patience and then acclimate your yeast fully and you will have the best experience possible. So uh, with all these things in mind, I know that it seems like a lot of you guys are like, well, I already do this stuff and that's great. I understand that you do. However, um, if I think for someone like me, if I'd seen a video and I'd actually taken the time to watch a video and not gone, okay, well, I have patience. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, then I might have made fewer mistakes in my first mead process. So follow these six things, and there are a bunch more. You know, I'm not going to claim to know everything, but these are the six that I have experienced and that I have learned from in the past. I am going to make sure and link a video for these uh, six videos, or excuse me, five videos. The patience one is its own thing. You don't really have, a, have to do a video for patience. But these are also going to be different. So if you want to know more about picking a yeast, I have the short version, which I told you, and then I have the long version, which is, um, has more in depth about the specific yeast that I use and how the process actually works. Uh, if you want to know about primary and secondary fermentation, I have information about that. If you want to know about providing yeast with nutrients, I have information about that. Sanitizing, there's a video that I have made. And then also um, acclimating the yeast. And there's, like I said, a bunch of videos that are going to be out. So the big thing is I will take and put all of these notes into the description of uh, in some kind of doc form. So you can go through and you can read along if you want. And that way um, you're not completely lost. It's a lot of information. I've talked a lot. Try to make this video short. But uh, there's just a lot of things to learn. So if you like this video, please leave a like, leave a comment. Um, I've tried to make sure and be thorough with this stuff. So I'd love to see that... Um, you know, if it's, if it's worth it, hopefully these videos, I can do them more in the future. And especially as I go further along with my mean making, I'll learn more and uh, gladly share the things that I figured out with you guys. So thank you guys for watching. Be sure to check out these videos. I'll try and link them as best as I can. And then um, leave a comment, ask questions, and I will see you guys in the next video. So, hey, have a good day.